Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming today. It's great to be back at Senator Spilka's uh, Elder Fair. Uh, I think this is our fifth year here. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us at Myrick O'Connell, 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro. I do nothing but elder law. They do the rest. Um, some of you folks have heard me speak before, so you know that this is kind of my, my area, and the people I'm always talking about are typically Frank and Mary. You've heard about my friends Frank and Mary uh, and their children Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. I, I always start with the same corny joke that if you get that, that means you're old enough to be in this class. You know, the younger people, I say that, they go like, what? Is that, you know, what does that mean? And, and Frank and Mary um, live in their own house. Their house in this, in this example is worth $600,000. It's a nice house. Uh, and its mortgage is paid, and they got an IRA worth one or 200, and he's got an annuity worth 75, and they got cash worth about 75, so they have total assets of about $950,000. Frank makes $2,000 a month, uh, $1,500 from Social Security and $500 from a pension. Mary makes $1,000 a month, which is half of, um, um, half of uh, excuse me, which is a little more than half of Frank's because Mary was working on her own during her life. So, they're making $3,000 a month or $36,000 a year. They're happy in their home. Um, their basic goal in life is that they want to die and be buried in the backyard. That's every, every one of my clients. And they basically want to make sure if one spouse dies, the other spouse is secure. And that once both spouses are dead, are dead, you divide up everything among the kids. If this sounds familiar, I bet, to a lot of people. So, they're, and of course, as I said, they want to die and be buried in the backyard. So they don't ever, ever, ever want to leave that house. They've been living there for a long time. They like it. Many of the neighbors have moved away, but it's their neighborhood, you know. It's their house. It's their backyard. Um, and I always tell people, this is all terrific and makes a lot of sense um, for folks as long as you're safe. As long as you're safe. But you don't want to be in this situation um, if you're not safe because and you don't want to be in this situation if, well, it, it, the, the, I guess the, the hardest balance for people that I find when, when I'm talking to folks in this situation is they really like their house and they've lived in it for years and years and they really like it, except the neighbors have moved away or they get old or they died, you know? And so the neighborhood is a little different than it was when they, when they were um, growing up. And the house isn't as safe as it was and no matter how safe they try to make the house in the winter, there's still snow out there and they're still having to shovel and do all of that stuff. So it may be that at some point that they want to think about whether they would rather be um, not in that house uh, but in a community of people, right, but still living very independently, having their own place but being in a community where they're not shoveling any snow and where they don't really have to make food if they don't feel like making food and a lot of stuff is kind of taken care of. Um, so and Mary's goal, of course, like Frank's goal, is never, never, never send me to a nursing home. And I always tell people, you know, that's a great motto, except, you know, you can do a lot to help yourself in this case. Don't fall down. Don't fall down, right? Don't break your hip. I mean, there are a number of th safety things that can end you up just in the place where you never be, and one of the nice features um, I have found of, of assisted livings is that They've kind of figured a lot of that out. That is their point. That is the way that they market, is that they're providing a place in which, you know, they're really selling the fact that the food's really good, you know, and that there's programming and that you don't have to be driving to Boston anymore because there's a folks, groups of folks going a bus to Boston and, you know, you go to the symphony and you do this and that. But really, really, underneath it all, it's that it's safe, that it's really a safe environment. So, um, once again, I guess the question for Frank and Mary is, are you ready for assisted living? So I've asked, uh, a couple of folks to join me today. Um, one of them is Deb Gittner. Uh, she and her partner, Linda Sullivan, are geriatric care managers. They call themselves something else, but I'm too old to remember what that is. Geriatric care managers, you may not have even heard that term uh, it, because it really didn't exist about 15 years ago. It is really composed of people who were typically uh, nurses or social workers, or both, who decided, but really liked dealing with elders, and decided that they really wanted to be kind of case managers and advocates for elders and, and make that their specialty, um, which elders in many cases really need because the world of services available to elders is, as you all know, no, not exactly a one-stop shop. You know, the services are kind of like all over the place, so as to help them figure that out. So I asked Deb to come because a lot of her folks have faced this kind of issue to help you think out 
first of all, does it make sense to be in assisted living? And then if it does, you know, there, there's no plain vanilla assisted living. There are a million of them. They're all trying to market to you. You probably get mailings about these folks all the time in the mail, right? Or emails or stuff. So how do you figure that out? So Deb, could you just talk about that for a while? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. By the way, the, she and her partner, Linda Sullivan, I, deal with, I do nothing but this kind of work. They are the best geriatric care manager team I have seen in Massachusetts. They're just terrific. So there's a small, that's not an ad, I'm just telling you, okay? And you know how this works. Yes. Okay, as Arthur said, my name is Debbie Gittner. I am a social worker. My business partner is Linda Sullivan, who is an RN, registered nurse. And together we are Elder Care Resource Services. What we do as geriatric care managers, aging life care professionals, our organization that we are certified through went through a new name, a new branding. And so that's why the name has changed to Aging Life Care Association. And then from there, people are able to you take those words and put a label on themselves. They can still be geriatric care managers, they can be aging life care specialists, aging life care professionals. So we're still in this rebranding um, period right now. But what basically what we do is we do an assessment of people's needs. What do people want? What do people need? What is the care that they actually have at this moment? so that we can put together a plan of care that's appropriate for people. What is the best options and how do you get to that? Um, you have a plan and how do you make it happen? For caregivers, it helps them reduce stress and anxiety as you're navigating this very complicated medical maze. As you can see, as geriatric care managers and as care managers, we, can, we are sort of in the middle. Um, and we can work with many agencies. We have the resources, the knowledge, the ability to open doors and to make contacts because we know people. In assisted livings, in nursing homes, we also know how rehab settings work. We have relationships with financial planners. We have relationship with legal, with attorneys. Arthur is our go-to number one. Um, financial position, I will be honest, we really actually go through the lawyers for that, but that was on a slide from our national organization. Um, so that's, a, that's in essence what we do. Let's now move on to the subject at hand is what is an assisted living? It's a social model, and that's important because a nursing home is a medical model, and that is the difference between the two. Assisted living is a social model. That's how it's been designed, and that's, those are the guidelines here in Massachusetts. And it is, there are three different models here in Massachusetts, the independent, the traditional, and the memory. And there's also sort of a fourth that's just been recreated or sort of developed, and it's called blended, and I'll discuss that as well. But really, it's the independent, traditional, and memory that you're going to hear more about today. The independent model is just that. It is an independent setting where you may have one meal a day with the option of three meals a day. Um, people's memories are fairly sharp. Some people may still be driving, and the activities geared in the independent model, the options that are offered for people who still may be reading book clubs, who want to have a discussion about politics, who may be able to participate and want to do arts and crafts, and many, many activities that really keep people very active. Um, and as I said earlier, it's typically for someone who just says, this house has gotten too big. I'm just tired of taking care of it and managing it. For my father, it, the, uh, he all of a sudden had a, he, he called me one day and he said, the light bulb on the garage door went out. He said, I can't get up on a ladder anymore. He said, I have to call someone to get to put a light bulb and replace the light bulb on the garage door. He said, this house is too much. When I can't do that anymore, he said, I know my house is too big for me. He hasn't moved yet, but he knows the house is too big. We're working on one step at a time. <laughs> it's my mother who doesn't want to move. Um, the assisted living model, the traditional assisted living, they provide help with personal care. Typically, it's 45 to 60 minutes of care per day, seven days a week, and it's 
Every facility, you have to ask questions. Facilities operate, some give it in longer chunks, some give it in 15 minute chunks can you, of can time. You personal care? Can you talk about what that means? Because sure. Because it means a lot of things to different people. Sure, it can be help with bathing, grooming, dressing, showering, putting on Ted stockings in the morning. It can be escort service to and from the dining room, to and from some, ac some activities. So that's what it is. That is help with personal care. Three meals a day, there is a nurse in the building. And again, I go back to the guidelines of Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, the nurses in the building are not able to perform the typical nursing responsibilities that you think of. They're not allowed to give somebody injections if they're a diabetes. They're not allowed to change a wound. They're not allowed to take temperatures. They're not allowed to do blood pressures. And you have to know that because when you tour facilities and they tell you that the nurse isn't doing it, it's not that they don't want to, it's just that they can't. In the traditional model, your relative continues to see their primary care physician. Some facilities ha offer a physician or a nurse practitioner coming in so that you don't have to keep taking your relative out to the primary care physician. And if that's something that has always been a hardship, especially with winter, going out to the doctors, then find out if there's a physician or nurse practitioner that comes into the building. Your relative can continue to see their specialists they can see their cardiologist, their ophthalmologist, your, their urologist, any of the ologists that they see, they're still able to see and continue to make appointments. They can come and go, go out for meals with family, go home for holidays. You have to think of it as this is their new home, this is their apartment, but it has a lot of amenities with it. If somebody needs physical therapy, the visiting nurses can come in or some of the other um, agencies that provide similar services to the VNA can also come in. The memory loss is for people who have memory loss. It's for people who need more care, more hands-on help throughout the day with bathing, grooming, dressing, sometimes eating as well sometimes help getting in and out of a chair. As memory loss progresses, more care is needed. They also have activities geared for the needs of the population. They're going to have activities that meets the needs. Many of the assisted livings, you want to ask, what are the activities? Are they followed by maybe the Alzheimer's Association, which may make recommendations? Are they followed by some of the other well-known authors? You know, what do they do for their activities to keep the brain as stimulated as possible? You want to ask about staff ratio. Um, that's very important. You also want to, you know, many of them are locked units. And they're not locked because people can't leave. They're locked because of the safety. They don't want that one chance that somebody may decide to open a door and walk out. And then they don't know where they are and it becomes very confusing. Um, sometimes people go directly from the community into a memory loss and sometimes it's a transition. Maybe people started in the independent, moved to the traditional, and now to the memory. The blended model, which is a wonderful opportunity for so many people at this moment, it's a blend of the independent and traditional. So you can move into an apartment, not have to move to a different building, a different apartment, as you need more care. You can stay in that apartment and receive more care, and it's absolutely wonderful. And I know, as Dixie's gonna talk about her facility, it's, they offer that opportunity, and it's really very good. Um, and the community offers care on an individual basis so that, again, you are staying and aging in place. How do I find a good assisted living? Um, you have to think about your relative. Are they shy? Are they outgoing? Are they an introvert? Um, have they always joined activities? Have they been very involved in the church? Have they done a lot of volunteer work? Who they are stays. Sometimes people who are very quiet, isolated, may come out to one activity. Sometimes people who are very isolated may still stay in their apartment and watch their television and stay on the telephone. We can't make people change, but you want to make sure that the facility can embraces who they are as a person. And so they're not gonna be forced out to join and play bingo 
if they hate bingo and have never played it in their life and they never are going to. Sometimes you can get people out to a small group. Music tends to be an activity that people tend to like to listen to because they don't have to voice an opinion or talk too much. They can just sit there and smile, clap their hands, and really feel good inside. Um, you know, what are their favorite foods? Look at the menu. Ask the question. You know, what ha they only like Italian food, or they only like, you know, tomato sauce. You know, find out, can they be offered? Can they be offered grilled cheese if there's nothing else that they like? You know, what are the alternatives? Food is... You know, we all have particular tastes. And sometimes food can be very, very good at a facility, but a relative can say, I just don't like it. And sometimes it's their only control in life. And I say that, take it, the complaint with a grain of salt sometimes, because it's the only thing they have left to choose and control over. The, and that's very important. I can speak about the food at, I've tried the food at the residence at Valley Farm, and it's excellent. The chef is fabulous. But by the way, that's the reason to shop. That's the reason. You want to know ahead of time if you like the food. Absolutely. Right. Have a meal. Definitely have a meal. All other questions to ask, staff ratio, that's very important. You need to know, you know, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, what's the staff ratio? What's the staff ratio at night? Do they all do quarry checks? You know, do they do criminal check backgrounds on people? That's very important. You don't want somebody working in a facility who has a criminal background. What's the cost? They're all comparable, um, but you need to know what you're going to pay. You need to know, you know, what extra charges could be. You, do, you want as few surprises as possible. Um, and the cost is very important to all of us. Look at the menu, look at the meal times. Are there assigned seating? Um, can meals be brought into the apartment if someone isn't feeling good? Can you bring meals in? Is there room service? Is there an extra charge for that? What happens under those situations? Okay, as I said, check the activity calendar. Um, there may be something on the activity calendar that may be of interest to your relative. It may be when music is played. It may be just coming out just to have a coffee social or have a drink. It, it, there may be something there. And if, you know, again, think about who your relative is. There may be nothing on the calendar, but they may not be very social at all. And you've got to think about the person. Medications, how are they dispensed? They, all the facilities have their own protocol, and you need to know how it's dispensed. Are there charges for medication dispensing? How often is the rent increased? Is your contract a one-year, two-year contract? Who's available 24-7? Because you know that if someone's going to fall or have a medical need, it's always going to be at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it isn't going to be at, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when everybody is in the building. Ask about the role of the nurse, as I said earlier. You know, there are some guidelines put in by Massachusetts, so ask how each facility reads and interprets the guidelines. The dues. Always, 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 always have an elder law attorney such as Arthur read the contract. These contracts are very important. They are a legal document and you need to have someone read them and interpret what's being written so that the lawyer can explain everything to you in English. Ask about the fees upon admission. Many of the facilities have a community fee when you first move in and you want to find out about the fees, what are any extra costs. Every facility has a service plan, which means sort of a care plan of what are your relatives' needs, this is what we're providing, and this is what we will continue to provide. So you want to be in and invited to those meetings, which you will be, but it's very important to make sure that they're all accurate. If your relative should need some private help, can you bring private help in? Does the facility have agencies that they work with that they would recommend? Is there a respite program? Respite is a wonderful program. It allows someone to move into the building for a trial period. Some facilities offer it for, a mandatory for a month. Some you can try it for a week or two weeks, especially if you're coming out of the hospital or it's winter time. It's a nice way to say, you know, it's January. Why don't we try one month respite 
see it as a vacation. Are there government assistance programs? Most facilities do not. When the assisted livings about 20 years ago became established in Massachusetts, they all were designed and set up for private pay. A few may have, and I say a very tiny few, may have a low income options. Ask if there's government assistance. Again, there's very few that offer it, but a few do. And the biggest question is, what happens if the money runs out? You need to know and plan for that because it, it, it happens. Some people you hope don't outlive their money, but sometimes it does. Arthur's got a great way to keep the money going, so he'll be talking about that. Thank you very much, Deb. Thank you. Uh, Dixie Emon. Ah, somebody already went to see Dixie Emon's place. Dixie Emon is from the, uh, one of the brand new assisted living facilities, which is the residences in, uh, at, in the residence at Valley Farm in Ashland. But I guess what the, the, the goal of the exercise, if you're looking for assisted livings, is you got to shop. You got to shop around. There's a bunch of these places now. Uh, there are some that are 20 years old. There are some like these that are brand new. There are some ha that have different kind of designs. I think uh, Deb has often said when you're, when you're do, trying to figure this out, it's kind of like bringing your kids around for college. You start going to these places, you go to enough places, and there's one that, you, that, that someone's going to say, ooh, that just felt right, and that's the right one. And you have to go find that. You know, there's no obvious you know, the website. That, nothing's going to really tell you that except going. Among other things, though, do go eat, right? <coughs> Um, but, but Dixie's going to talk to you about hers so you can get a sense of how this one works. These, this is brand new, so it's kind of like the latest and greatest. Um, but there are, there are, you know, you want convenience, you want pl a place that is typically close to your kids. We found most people in assisted livings are moving there because specifically they want to be close to their kids, you know. And that's, but you don't want to be like with your parents, you know, you don't want to be with your kids. So Dixie, tell us a little bit about the residences. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, do that. Hi everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Dixie Emond, and I work at the residence at Valley Farm, and I've had the good fortune to meet most of you here today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our company, about the residence, about our amenities, um, but I'm going to do something a little bit different, too, and just try and touch upon what Arthur and Deb has, have already highlighted for us today, but kind of bring it home firsthand to how this community of ours would actually be for you on a day-to-day -day basis because I think those are the questions that often come up when I'm giving folks like yourselves a tour of our community. Um, we are part of LCB Senior Living. We're headquartered in Norwood, Mass. The good news about that is the executives of our company they aren't new kids on the block for this industry. A lot of folks, as we're all getting older, have decided to join this path of helping seniors, but they may not have the longevity and the expertise that we do. Um, the other thing is, because we are local, locally owned and operated, we have a very hands-on team of executives that often pop into our community unannounced. So, um, but that's good for you. We have very high standards, and um, we're always changing how we do things things for the better and I don't mean we're just switching things up but we're always trying to learn the best way because things change frequently with technology and research and such and we wish to be part of that so that we can pass it on to our residents um, we do collaborate with Harvard and Brigham and Women's um, we have a gentleman on our executive staff he's a recently published author named Josh Freitas he is rolling out programs and implementing uh, programs and activities and such across our whole company so that at the residence at Valley Farm, our, our associates, that's our staff, but we refer to them as associates, can actually be certified dementia practitioners, um, utilizing programs that are going to address the social, cognitive, physical, and emotional well-being of all of our residents. That's really important. Um, what are we? Well, we're a rental community. Okay, we have 80 apartments. As Deb was mentioning, we have a model that's the integrated blended type of model, so that of the 60 apartments in our independent and assisted living 
part of our community. We have studio one and two bedroom apartments and they're all integrated. So if Millie w moved in and lived across the hall from me and she was independent like she is now but down the road needed some services, she doesn't have to transition to a new apartment. She doesn't have to change to another dining room and that has a stigma and impact to people. You know, if, if I'm friends with Millie and we're meeting for breakfast and all of a sudden she has to go to a different dining room, that's not so much fun for me or her, okay? Um, we do have 20 apartments in our memory care neighborhood. We refer to it as reflections, as I just did. Those 20 apartments are all studios. They do have kitchenettes like our other apartments. They won't have a two burner cooktop, but they have a kitchenette. A lot of memory care apartments don't have that. We wanted folks to feel as, as much like they are at home as possible. Um, our memory care community is a secure community in that if there are folks with memory decline, if they're um, starting to be exit seeking and such, we don't want folks to wander off, but it's not like a locked institutional unit, okay? It's a beautiful community, it's very active and vibrant, um, and, it, and we try to integrate programming as such as best we can, depending on where our residents are, okay? Um, of those 20 apartments and reflections, two are what we call companion suites, and it's an option that makes it a more affordable for some folks, or it might be appropriate for a husband and wife and such. We also sometimes have maybe a husband that lives on the traditional area, but maybe the wife is in the memory care, and that way they can still stay in the same community and see each other all the time. It's a nice option. Okay, um, as far as amenities, when someone moves into the residence at Valley Farm, they sign a lease, typically for a year. They'll pay their first month's rent, their last month's rent, which actually goes into escrow. We also have a one-time community fee like Deb alluded to, okay? Um, the rates are all going to be different depending on your need and your assessment. Independent is less expensive than assisted. Our assisted programming includes up to one hour of care per day, based on what Deb was explaining. So if someone needs maybe a little bit of cueing or reminder to take a medication, maybe they need a little help with dressing or showering, that doesn't take an hour. So we're not going to nickel and dime you. When you're asking and shopping around to look at different communities, just like when you look at the colleges, you need to know what it includes and you want to compare apples to apples. It's really important. When we quote you, on, our rates are all inclusive. So if we're saying it's up to one hour of care per day for an assisted living apartment, um, we're not adding in additional services. We can, okay, depending on the need. But as far as the one hour of day, uh, when we quote something, it's including everything, the maintenance, it's including three meals a day. We actually have any time dining at the residence at Valley Farm. So the food is delicious, as Deb said, um, but it's also something that allows you to keep your independence. Like today, you know, if I want to have my eggs at noontime, I can have my eggs at noontime. If I want to sleep in, I can sleep in. If you have your daughter coming to visit you today and she's late, heaven forbid, and you're afraid, oh jeepers, I'm going to miss my lunch, my good lunch, my restaurant style dining lunch, okay? You're not going to miss it. You can go have lunch at two o'clock if you wish. Um, it's a really wonderful feature and it's something you're not going to see in a lot of places. Um, so that's one of the differentiators, but sometimes food isn't important to someone. So we really want to talk about the kinds of things that we can offer to people that's important to them. When we talked about programming and activities, we have a resident engagement director. Her goal is really to have activities and programming and exercise that is going to be meaningful to you. Because if we're offering things that you don't wish to do, huh, guess what, you won't do it. We are not there for ourselves. We are there for you. This is your home. I actually toured someone Thursday evening around our community and one of the daughters said, um, can we come and visit? Can we stay over in our mom's apartment? And I'm like, absolutely. This is their home. This is not institutional. This is, um, uh, you know, we do have people sign in and out. We'd just like to know who's coming in and out of our building. Um, we have a lot of staff that other communities may not have. We actually have on-site dentistry. We have a beauty salon. We have um, 
Uh, we have care tenders who uh, VNA on site, so they offer occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy right on site. We have Lynn O'Brien, who is one of, she is actually a nurse practitioner. She is currently working with 80% of our residents that have moved in just to help in any kind of medical capacity because she can prescribe medicine. And even though we have nursing on staff from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week, uh, the VNA can do injections. We don't do injections, just to give you an example of kind of what sets us apart. It's a beautiful community. I feel like I'm doing way too much talking, which, as most of you who know me, isn't a rare thing. Oh, and you're such a, wild, a, a wallflower <laughs> normally. Uh, thank you, thank you very, thank, thank you, you, thank you very much, Dixie. And, and, and by the way, I just wanted to follow up on this. No, I, I, I don't work for these folks. I, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm a very large law firm. Uh, I just, as part of this presentation, I needed to pick somebody. Um, and I've dealt with these folks as well as a whole bunch of others. And they are kind of like the newest, right? And, and one, of the, one of the reasons why you want to shop is because you are going to be finding, like for example, this Anytime Dining. That's the first time I'd ever heard of that, right? But, it, but it, 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 it's really the industry responding to people wanting to, it to be nicer and nicer in assisted living. So let me talk to you a little bit about money, because this is my, typically when my clients are thinking about this stuff, many people will simply say, yeah, that's great, but I can't afford this. I just can't afford this, because they'll see what the monthly charge is and they'll say, this is impossible. So I'm going to go back, we're going to talk about money. Remember, this is Frank and Mary, that's their total assets, Those, that's their income. So they've got income of about $36,000 a year, they got a house worth $600, they got other assets worth $350. So figure that, their assisted living bill, if they're going in and they're not demand, requiring, you know, it's not a, a really serious, they need a tremendous amount of services, it's gonna be about $6,000 a month. This is gonna vary from place to place. As Dixie has said, and as, and as Deb has said, the, the goal of this story is you gotta do the math, right? Um, but say that it's $6,000 a month, and when you're living there, of course, you're still living, right? So you're still going out sometimes, you probably still got your car, you're doing other stuff. You're not paying a lot of the old bills you used to pay, so your costs are going down. But figure that Frank and Mary are still spending $1,000 a month on other stuff, $12,000 a year on fun. So their total cost of living is $84,000. Their income, remember, was $36,000, which means the burn rate, the rate at which they're using up their existing money, uh, is $48,000 a year. If they move to assisted living but keep their house because they want to make sure that they've got a, you know, an exit strategy here, they're like, if this really stinks, I want to go back to my house, then they've got $350,000 um, divided by that $48,000 means their money is going to evaporate in 7.29 years, right? Now, most of my clients are just not going to do that. If they thought, that, if they thought their money was going to run out, you know, depending on how old you are in 7.29 years, you're not going there, right? So let's just talk about some other possibilities. One possibility in their case, remember they've got a house that's worth $600,000, would be to get an equity line of credit from the bank. Um, you could, they, if they could do that in today's market, if they did that, they're not going to have a problem getting that loan, right? Because they've got a lot of equity in their house. Say that they borrowed half of the value of their house, or $300,000. That's going to give them a monthly payment to the bank uh, at 4% interest of about $1,000 a month, which means their income, remember their income was $36,000. Now they've got a mortgage payment of $12,000 of $12,000 a year. Uh, they've got their assisted living bill, right, of, uh, of, and their fund. Can't forget the fund, right, of $84,000. So now, um, if you took their income and subtracted those, you would find that the burn rate on their money has gone up because they now have to pay the interest on that mortgage. However, They've also, got, they've also increased their pile of money available but to $650,000. At that amount, divided by that burn rate, they're going to be able to stay in that assisted living for 10 years, right? Now let's, give an, let's do, do another possibility. Let's say that they've been there for a few years and they decide, oh, this is working out okay. I really don't mind this, right? So, it, and, and why am I maintaining this house exactly? Because I'm now in assisted living and I'm comfortable with this, so they're going to sell their house. Well, if they sell their house, then that house turns into a big pile of money, $600,000. If they've got income of $36,000 minus their fund, remember their burn rate was $48,000, right? But now the pile of money that they've got left to, to spend is a lot bigger because they don't own their house anymore. Their pile is now $950,000, and now their money's going to be okay 
for 19.79 years. So Frank and Mary, right, unless they're thinking they're gonna live for, I mean, let me, the nice thing I like about dealing with old folks is that everybody understands they're gonna die, right? I mean, I have younger people who don't get that. A lot of your kids maybe don't get that, right? And they, but they get that, and their goal of life is not to not die, it's to live their life as well as possible. And so the question is, is this the way that they wanna live their lives? And I guess what I'm saying is in Frank and Mary's case, they could do that. But suppose they're still not comfortable with this. I wanna give you one more option. Um, if, if, if Frank and Mary or one of them really does need a lot of care, right? Not a lot, a lot of care, but needs help with at least two of the activities of daily living, which are uh, eating, dressing, bathing, toileting, and transferring, getting up and around the house. If, a, if in the opinion of a nurse, doesn't have to be a doctor, a healthcare professional, they need help with two of those activities, and if the cost of assistance, as in Dixie's case, is included in the monthly bill, then the entire monthly payment becomes a medical deduction for tax purposes, a medical deduction, right? Now, why would Frank and Mary care? They got like no income. Why do they care about a deduction? Well, assume that one of their kids is, make, is doing okay. Right? Not doing like fabulous, this isn't like the upper 1%, but doing okay. And he lives in Massachusetts, which means if he's doing okay, he's paying the Massachusetts income tax of 5% a year, and say he's in a 28% federal tax bracket. You don't have to be making a whole lot of money to get to a 28% tax bracket. That means his taxes every year are 33%. So, and suppose Frank and Mary trust Peter right, which I'm assuming that they do in this case, because otherwise this wouldn't work for them. But if they trust Peter, and they gave him their money, and he paid their assisted living bill every month, then because he's providing more than 50% of their total cost of living, they become his dependents. And his payment to the assisted living facility becomes a medical deduction of his, which means if he's, in that, if he's earning that kind of money, he can take 33% of the money that he's paying for that assisted living, take it off his taxes, which means it's money he's not paying the IRS and the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. In this case, that would give Frank $23,760 that, that he is not paying to the, the IRS and the Department of Revenue. So he's got it. Now, assuming that you trust Peter, and that he's not gonna go use this money and go on a vacation with it, because, oh Jesus, I saved all this money. This is terrific. And instead, he throws it into the pot from, for Frank and Mary. What that really means is that Frank and Mary's income just went up, right? It just went up from $36,000 a year to $59,760 a year, because they've got their regular income and they've got the money that Peter's giving them instead of giving it to the federal government and the state government. Now, if that's their income every year, then look at their income uh, minus the cost of living and their fund, their burn rate goes down to $24,240 a year. And they can stay in assisted living it, there for 39.19 years. Now, that's gotta be enough time. That's just gotta be enough time. And the reason why I mention that is, now, once again, now you're saying to yourself, yeah, but they really had a big house, right? It was a $600,000 house but cut that house in half, make it just a $300,000 house. That still means that just about for everybody, if you, use this, if you use this model, right, you can stay in assisted living for a long time, probably over 20 years, probably over 20 years. So the greatest fear, the greatest fear of my clients, and most of my, the fo folks that I talk to, elder law clients, I can, it, it, it's very simple. They're either worried about Alzheimer's or they've got Alzheimer's or somebody they know does. That's why they're talking to me, because they fear that as a result of that disease, they're gonna outlive their money. And I guess what I'm saying is, for this, in this kind of alternative, they can, they can know if they're in this financial situation that they, can, that they, can live, they will not outlive their money. They can live in a safe environment um, for the rest of their lives. Thank you very much. Any questions regard, from any of the folks that are here? If not, could I just have a quick round of applause for my wonderful guests for speaking with us here today? Thank you so much for coming. We'll be happy to answer questions. I know these folks will be glad to stay and answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of Senator Spilka's day. Thank you.